Hello and welcome to this lecture on performance management or PM. PM is an entire system devoted to getting the most out of employees engaged in the process of achieving organizational goals. Its most critical component is performance appraisal. So most of this lecture focuses on performance appraisals, except when the concepts need to be differentiated. Most business practitioners do a horrible job on appraising or measuring their employees job performance. Job performance is the ultimate dependent variable that every employee selection test is trying to predict and that every manager is trying to maximize. Let's get started. As with all other HR functions, performance management is an essential function in the relationship with other HR functions. Let's take recruitment, for example. A performance appraisal technically judges the effectiveness of a firm's recruitment efforts. The quality of the applicants determines the feasible performance standards. For example, in a tight labor market, firms sometimes have to hire just about anybody to fill their vacancies. If the right folks are recruited and hired, then they should be able to perform the job well. Thus, their performance appraisal scores should be acceptable. Taking selection even a step further, I'm sorry, taking recruitment a step further is selection. Performance appraisal is absolutely critical in the validation of selection tests. A good selection tool should provide scores that are closely aligned with scores on a performance appraisal. That is a validation. Selection should produce workers who are best able to meet the job requirements. Now let's turn to training and development. Formal performance appraisals are designed to determine weak spots and training needs. Training and development aids in the achievement of performance standards. Well, how about compensation? Performance appraisals are one very important factor in determining pay. Reciprocally, compensation can affect appraisal of performance. Underpaid workers may withhold effort thus hampering their performance. Then, inferior performance results in reduced compensation, which leads to inferior performance, etc., etc., etc. Labor relations is also interrelated to performance appraisal in that a PA justifies personnel actions like termination, transfer, demotion, etc. However, the appraisal methods and standards may be subject to negotiation if the company is operating under a collective bargaining agreement. In other words, if they are unionized. Let's move on. This is the classic formula for performance. Performance is a function of ability, motivation, and the environment in which performance operates. Ability includes things like technical skills, interpersonal skills, problem solving, analytical skills, communication skills, and even physical limitations. Most of these things can be learned, but some are fairly innate. Motivation includes personal career ambition, limiting negative employee conflict, overcoming frustration, dealing in a fair manner so as to foster satisfaction, and setting clear goals and expectations. Good managers set up the conditions where employees can motivate themselves. The environment includes providing proper equipment and materials, excellent job design, stressless economic conditions, dealing effectively with unions, enacting and enforcing fair and clear rules and policies, providing management support for employee concerns, and abiding by all laws and regulations. This formula suggests that the same person in two different jobs might perform very differently, and two people in the same job might perform that same job very differently. Good managers do their best to adjust these variables to get optimum performance from their employees. Let's move on. At the heart of performance management is the performance appraisal process, which has many uses. Here are some of them. Most uses fall under two distinct categories. They're either developmental or administrative. Listed on this slide are some examples of the use of performance appraisals. 
First, it identifies strengths and weaknesses. Clearly, this is a developmental purpose of the performance appraisal. It allows a supervisor to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the subordinate. Another developmental purpose is it gives an opportunity to discuss subordinate performance and the expected performance standards. It also allows the supervisor to make recommendations for improvement to the subordinate. In the administrative side, it provides a basis for a salary recommendation, and it provides supporting documentation regarding the subordinate's performance to minimize exposure to risk by the company in the event of a discrimination case. Now, clearly the first three are developmental purposes and the last three are administrative purposes. However, I cannot voice this too strongly that supporting documentation is critical. If you don't do performance appraisals properly and if you terminate someone for inferior performance and their performance does not match up with their performance appraisal, you might be in trouble. Let's move on. The reasons for setting performance standards are very important. Some standards are because of strategic relevance. That is, the performance standards are linked to the organizational goals and competencies. For example, if a firm has a goal of increasing sales by 10% this year, then each salesperson will have a new performance standard of 110% of last year's standard, on average. Of course, there are some pitfalls regarding measuring performance. First, we have criterion deficiency in which aspects of the actual performance are not measured. The criterion, the dependent variable, job performance, has some things that are not being measured. They are deficient. The next slide will depict this in graphical format. Another issue is criterion contamination, in which elements that affect the, perf the performance appraisal are measured, but they are not part of the actual performance. This too is on the next slide. The reliability of scores on a selection test or a performance measure must be consistent across raters and or over time. These scores must be accurate and dependable and not random or error prone. We cover a few sources of rater error in greater detail later in this lecture. Let's move on. So here is a Venn diagram of what we hope to measure in a performance appraisal and what sometimes actually gets or does not get measured. Let's start with the actual performance of the job. In this ellipse are all of the things that are part of doing the job. Then we'll superimpose what is contained in the performance appraisal. The area in the middle or the overlap in the Venn diagram is a valid assessment but we can see that the two ellipses do not fit directly on top of each other. We have imperfect measurement. The leftmost area in the green ellipse is criterion contamination. It is something that is measured, but is not supposed to be measured. The performance appraisal score is contaminated by things that should not be measured. For example, some performance appraisals are contaminated by things like volunteering to work on unpaid charity drives. Unless that's part of the job description, performance on it should not be measured. Sometimes, even though we know our formal appraisal is not supposed to cover such activities, we do them anyway in the hopes that being a so-called good soldier will positively impact our formal appraisal scores. So, even though contamination is bad, Bringing donuts to work every single Friday can be good. And the rightmost area in the blue ellipse is criterion deficiency. This contains part of what is actually performed in the job and should be measured, but is not. The performance appraisal instrument or method is deficient. So here's an example. Suppose a salesperson's semi-annual performance appraisal measures number of individual sales, but not the dollar value of those sales. If so, then it is likely to be deficient in that the dollar value of sales usually matters a lot. Some retail clerks can then game the system 
by asking customers to carve their purchases up into, say, eight individual sales instead of all eight products on one sale. It might be hard to do, but good managers design performance appraisal systems that are neither deficient nor contaminated and that cannot be gamed. Let's move on. Next, we have to consider the various sources of, of appraisal information. So most performance appraisals depend upon information gathered by the employee's direct supervisor. These performance appraisals are done by that employee's manager, and then they are often reviewed by a manager even one level higher. Other sources include the employee's subordinates. These performance appraisals are for managers with subordinate employees which is more appropriate for developmental than for administrative purposes. That is, the information helps develop the manager's skills, but we don't often let subordinates determine if a manager is getting a raise or not. Some appraisals are done by the self of the self and are generally done on an appraisal form completed by the employee prior to the performance interview. Rarely do we let employees be the only and sole source of a performance appraisal, but when we let them do a self-appraisal, it can be very useful for the developmental aspects of performance appraisal. One might think that employees are always more lenient on themselves than their supervisor is, but that is actually far from the case. Many employees are harder on themselves than their boss is. An increasingly common form of performance appraisal is from peers. These performance appraisals are done by one's fellow employees, generally on forms that are compiled into a single profile for use in the performance interview conducted by the employee's manager. Team performance appraisals are increasingly common in the modern team-based workplace. They are often based on TQM, or Total Quality Management, concepts that recognizes team accomplishment rather than individual performance. If compensation is team-based, then performance, or a major part of performance at least, should be team-based. One would be hard-pressed to unlink compensation and performance appraisal in an effective manner for teams. In many jobs, the customer contributes information to the performance appraisal, which, like team appraisal, is based on TQM concepts and seeks evaluation from both external and internal customers. To be clear, the so-called customer doesn't necessarily have to be the end consumer. It could be an internal customer in an assembly-based enterprise with co-located entities. Most of us are quite familiar with the customer comment cards in restaurants, auto and electronic dealers, and other retail operations. Those are customer forms of appraisal. Let's move on. It doesn't really matter what the source of the appraisal is if the information is collected inappropriately or if it is subject to error. Amongst the most common errors is the error of central tendency, which is also known as regression to the mean. In this case, the performance rating error occurs when all employees are rated about average. If no one is rated as low and no one is rated as high, there's no variability or variance in the scores. Score variability or score variance is an essential ingredient in the calculation of score reliability. Some firms used a forced distribution method and require some subordinates to be scored low, others to be scored medium, and yet others to be scored high. This is akin to forcing scores onto a normal bell curve, which can be unsettling for some employees. Another major error is, or two errors, is leniency or strictness. This is a performance rating error in which the appraiser tends to give employees either unusually high or unusually low ratings. Again, as in central tendency, score variance is essential for score reliability. So when all ratings are high or all or low, the reliability of scores is near zero. 
Similar to me error is a performance rating error in which an appraiser inflates the evaluation of an employee because of a mutual personal connection. For example, a, bot, a boss might give all Red Sox fans high scores and all Yankees fans low scores or some such. However, most of the time, this type of error is quite subtle and unintentional. People tend to prefer people with whom they have something in common. Opposites do not attract. Contrast error is a performance rating error in which an employee's evaluation is biased, either upward or downward, because of a comparison with another employee, usually just previously evaluated. Nobody wants to follow world-class chef Emeril Lagasse into the chef's performance appraisal line. If we follow the company's superstar in the appraisal process, our scores will likely pale in comparison. Recency error is a performance rating error in which the appraisal is based largely on the employee's most recent behavior rather than on behavior throughout the entire appraisal process. Its opposite is primacy error, which occurs when an employee's performance is appraised primarily on first impressions or behaviors that occurred in the beginning of the appraisal review period. Both errors are likely to be equally bad. Let's move on. This is the first of many slides containing most, but not all, of the commonly used performance appraisal methods. The first of these broad types are the trait methods. We'll spend time on three of the trait methods. The first trait method is known as the graphic rating scale which is sometimes just referred to as the basic rating scale method. For firms that use a graphic rating scale approach, each employee is rated on characteristics such as knowledge of work, initiative, dependability, etc., as in this table. These traits are measured with a response scale that's anchored, for example, by 1 equals failing and 5 equals excellent. The response range and the verbal anchors vary widely. On the three traits in this example, this particular incumbent earned a total score of 7. The range of possible scores is 3 to 15, so they're slightly below the middle of the possible scores. The graphic rating scale method does not measure behavior per se. It measures traits thought to influence behavior, and the rater must infer backward from the behavior they have read about or observed. This is a bit of an inferential leap. Let's move on. The second of the three trait methods discussed in this lecture is the mixed standards scale, which is based on a comparison with some predetermined standard. The incumbent is rated on how they compare using responses like better than, equal to, or worse than the standard. For better than, the incumbent gets a plus mark. For equal to, they get a check or a zero. And for scores or responses to the items on which the incumbent is worse than, they get a minus. In this example, each incumbent is rated on how they compare to the predetermined standard. And this employee here scores better than on two items, equal to on one item, and worse than the standards on another item. Let's move on. The forced choice method is a trait approach to performance appraisal that requires the rater to choose from statements designed to distinguish between successful and unsuccessful performance. However, each statement in the pair is equally favorable or equally unfavorable. Some of these choices are tough indeed. It has fallen a little bit out of favor lately. In this example, the rater must choose whether the incumbent is sloppy or lazy tough choice, or if they show initiative or are responsive to customers, another tough choice. This incumbent works quickly, shows initiative, but is sloppy and often rude. Picking between sloppy and lazy or between late or rude is sort of odd if neither trait is present in the incumbent. Additionally, to be effective, the list of paired words must be very, very long. 
Let's move on. This is the first of four behavioral methods of performance appraisal. The critical incidence method can be used for performance appraisal, much like it can be used for job analysis and like it can be used to develop a selection test. In this behavioral method, any unusual event that denotes superior or inferior employee performance in some part of the job is, rec is recorded. For example, saving a baby from a fire indicates pretty important aspects of performance, but being negligent in one's duties and getting a coworker severely injured like this guy on the floor in the office indicates inferior performance. Let's move on. The Behaviorally Anchored Rating Scale or BARS Behaviorally Anchored Rating Scale is a behavioral approach to performance appraisal that consists of a series of vertical scales one for each important dimension of job performance of which there are usually many. Each number on the response scale is anchored to a behavior. This particular dimension measures problematic employee behavior. This method anchors a score to a specific behavior to avoid perceptual errors. Everyone completing the bars knows exactly what sort of behavior gets a four and what sort of behavior gets a three. This example has only one, again, of the many possible dimensions being scored. There are likely many, many more dimensions measured. Let's move on. The Behavioral Observation Scale, or BOS, is a behavioral approach to performance appraisal that measures the frequency of observed behavior. The rater is asked to indicate how often the incumbent engages in specific behaviors. For example, the rater might be asked to indicate if an incumbent almost always does the behavior, frequently does the behavior, sometimes does it, etc. Of course, these behaviors must be job related and derived from one's job description. Additionally, the frequency of behavior may not indicate the quality of the behavior. For example, one can be very responsive to customer requests in that they may respond, but the quality of the response is not being measured here. Did they fix the problem or did they just acknowledge it for the customer? Nevertheless, it's an easy form of performance appraisal to use. Let's move on. The behavioral checklist is simply a, a list in which the rater checks those statements on the list that they believe are examples of the employee's behavior, their performance. It is basically a yes-no checklist. As with some other methods, it does not rate the degree of quality of the behavior. But like the BOS, they're easy to use by raters and very little training of the rater or appraiser is required. The final score for the employee is just the sum of the check marks. Employees can then be compared based on their sum scores. Let's move on. Next, we turn to two forms of results methods. In these methods, the rating is a function of actual results. A productivity measure uses a quantitative output measure like assembly line production or total dollar of sales some jobs are very well suited to this type of performance appraisal, but other jobs with non-quantitative output will find it difficult to implement. Think for a minute about the job of a trial attorney. Should that job's performance be calculated as total dollars won in court, number of cases won, or something altogether more difficult to measure like number of lives changed or amount of help offered to indigent clients? Clearly, not all jobs have quantifiable output. So, we can turn to Management by Objectives, or MBO. This is a rating of performance on the basis of employee achievement goals set by mutual agreement between the employee and the manager. MBO focuses performance improvement efforts on the goals to be achieved by employees rather than by the activities they perform or the traits they exhibit. This is a negotiated goal setting process. Its strength is in the ongoing iterative nature of the very frequent evaluation process. As such, 
it is more of a developmental and a control tool for performance than it is an actual evaluation tool. Let's move on. There are many important considerations regarding how to deliver or conduct an effective performance appraisal. First, keep it simple. A simplified evaluation can have greater consistency among reviews. Keeping it simple allows supervisors to effectively discriminate their top performers from other performers. Discrimination here is in the good sense. Set flexible objectives. The development of rating criteria must be flexible, as one size does not necessarily fit all in the organization. For example, strategic agility may only apply to vice presidents, while teamwork competencies may indeed apply to all. Involve the employee. It's important to get their feedback in order to develop realistic standards. Additionally, an employee's evaluation of their own performance provides for good self-reflection. Also, these self-assessments allow managers to see blind spots. Keep the objectives objective. Objectives must be achievable, measurable, and clear-cut. Also, focus on how employees achieve the objectives, not just on if they achieve them. Consider the timing. Some firms prefer to conduct all appraisals at the same time, while others prefer to conduct them on the individual employee's anniversary date. Shifting to a focal date approach increases the amount of time spent for a definite period each year, but it can facilitate the integration of individual appraisals with organizational objectives. However, placing a huge stack of appraisal forms on a vice president's desk for one month a year can be overwhelming. Using the anniversary date approach does not allow the tying together of individual performance with organizational performance, but it can spread the appraisals out more evenly throughout the year. Review the results with incumbents and with managers. Find out what managers want to know and measure. Appraisals can point out systemic training needs and deficiencies in company climate. However, the buck stops with line managers. They must be properly trained and they must conduct these appraisals. Additionally, buy-in from the top is critical. If employees know that upper management undergoes the same thing as they do, they will be more likely to take them seriously. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all, folks.